A side hustle Tia Hall started out of her dad's garage now earns $350,000 in monthly revenue for these two women. Once you see how much of this $350,000 Tia and Anastasia keep, you might drop everything and start selling sneakers yourself. Our online orders off the charts. These are not supposed to be there at all. That was an easy way that we found that you can make money. With those two things, we've built so many reoccurring customers. You can give it a sniff. How's it smell? I, 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 can, I, can, tell that, I can tell that's real. Yeah. And we'll even show you how to start your own reselling business with only $50. Big thanks to Taylor Brands for sponsoring this video. Welcome to a new episode of Upflip. My name is Caleb Puvener, and we are here with Tia Hall and Anastasia Lemley. How's it going? So good to meet yes, you guys. You as well. Thank you for having us. Yes. So let's get right into it. Where are we standing and why is this place important? It's basically outside of our personal house in North Seattle right now. This is kind of where we begin our day. We wake up, we get our shipping done, and then we head off to both of our stores to start our day of business. All right, Tia, so you're the one who originated the business and Anastasia joined later on, is that correct? That's yes, correct. about five years ago. Okay, great. So tell us how you got into the sneaker business. So basically I used to just go to the thrift store as a hobby and I eventually started to find some stuff in there that I was like, hey, I can make a little bit of money on this stuff. So I would buy it, take it home, list it on eBay, offer up. So it was kind of just a rinse and repeat of that process until I was able to save up enough money to kind of do it at a larger scale. When did you start your first store? So I resold through my dad's garage. He let me house literally everything in his garage for like two or three years. And then it just came to a nice. point where we couldn't fit anything in there. He was kind of giving me dirty looks. You know, it was time to just make the move and grow the business. And that's when we started looking for our first brick and mortar spot. Uh -huh. And that was in Seattle? That was in North Seattle, yes. Okay. So I think you eat, breathe, and sleep sneakers in Definitely. your business, but what about in your personal life? Do you actually enjoy sneakers? <laughs> we actually oh, yeah. do, surprisingly yeah, enough. As much as we see them, we do have actually a pretty big collection if you want to go inside and check it out. Okay, let's go. Okay, let's, let's do, do it. it. So this is our personal sneaker collection. Here we have stuff that we wear every day, some stuff that we don't wear every day. So in the beginning, would you organize stuff here and then take it out to the streets to sell in person? <laughs> uh, basically, yeah. I mean, we would keep the stuff at our house and if someone called us and they said they wanted to buy that pair, we would load it into the car, go to like a dark parking lot and just like sell the shoes. So that's kind of why we've transitioned into store. It's just a lot safer and we've definitely moved away from doing that. Okay, yeah. This one is actually kind of a fun one. This is the very first Jordan ever made from 1985. So this is nice. what, 38 years old? Wow. And it's still in great condition. It's just a great collector's piece. We don't, I mean, obviously it's too big for me to wear, but it's just a cool uh, piece to have in our collection. What would you say makes your business what it is today? I would probably say our ability to authenticate and make sure a shoe is not fake. Cause that is a huge problem in the industry. The most important aspect of reselling sneakers is authenticity. Stay around to find out exactly how to identify a fake using overlooked details like smell and texture. So let's get started with your day. You say you start in the house and you head to the store. What do we need to do? Yeah, let's go load up some boxes and then just head straight to the store. I right. hope your back's feeling okay today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, tell us where we're at now. So we're at the Alderwood Mall now in front of our second location. We actually just had grand opening this last Saturday. So this spot is really new. Nice. Why did you choose a mall location? Well, one thing that we struggled with with our first two locations was foot traffic. They're both standalones. So being in a mall, obviously you get the traffic of the mall. So that is the main reason why we wanted to be here, just to get more customers through the door. Our other two locations were destination spots, so people had to just want mm -hmm. to come to our store here. We get people just walking by, a lot more exposure, and it's something we've always wanted to be in the mall, mm -hmm. but lot higher costs here, and it's just something we weren't ready to jump into at mm -hmm. the very beginning. Uh -huh. And I feel like now we're a little bit more confident with the costs and yeah we're excited to see what yeah. it brings yeah what's the price point at how much are you paying for rent we're paying 13 13.5 13 here if somebody's just getting started and they don't have a lot of money what's the best way for them to get into the industry first thing is to have a job i mean these shoes are expensive it's not something that you can just jump into if you don't have a good job or if you want other ways to make money i think doing like we did, going into the thrift stores and finding stuff that people donated that you can take home, clean mm -hmm. and add value to it and then yeah. resell it online for a profit. That was an easy way that we found that 
you can make money. It's a lot easier to spend $5 on a shoe and sell it for 25, 30, 40 than it is to spend 200 on a shoe and try to sell it for 220, 240. Mm -hmm. Most people have an extra five bucks in their pocket than they would 200, you know. And then once you build up the money doing that, then you can jump into some of the more expensive shoes, which obviously have higher profit margins. Mm -hmm. But to just to start out, I think you should build up your capital as much as you can first. Okay. You mentioned how to get started, but is there a particular skill that somebody needs to be in this business? I think the biggest skill is being able to negotiate, learning how to talk to people, because you make your money when you buy the shoe, right? Mm -hmm. You don't always make it when you're selling it. You have to get it at the right price to get your profit margin. So making sure you're locking in the price that makes the most profit for your business is probably the best skill that you could have. Negotiating the purchase of your next sneaker pair is the bread and butter of this business. So to unlock your secret negotiation powers, keep watching as <laughs> Tia and Anastasia show you how it's done. Okay, where are we at now? All right, so this is our Tuckwill location, basically the headquarters. This is where a lot of the business operations happen. We get our, our large shipments in here, clean a lot of shoes here. We ship the majority of our items from here. And yeah, this awesome. is basically where, where we house a lot, of our inventory. Yeah, a lot of it. You're now in a much larger store, 2,200 square feet. So how did you know that Sneak City was ready for that move and how did that help you grow your business? I think we ran into the same issue that we did going from her dad's house into our first location. We just ran out of space. We had shoes all over the floor in Fremont. We had shoes in the back that we couldn't even come to the front. We had shoes at the house that we couldn't bring into the store. So having a bigger spot to house more was definitely the next move that we were ready for, but it mainly came down to space. Yeah, we moved from 400 square feet to 2,200 square feet, so it was, just something that needed to happen, and I think we have pretty much filled up this space, so we definitely are growing very fast. Yeah. All right, so here at the store, can you guys show us a little bit of the layout of this and how you chose it? The right side that we're looking at, this is all individual size, so each size has its own section because most people when they go shopping, they don't want to look at every single shoe, they want to know exactly what you have in your size. Yeah. So if you're a size nine, you go to the size nines and you can find everything we have over there. And then on this side over here, what we call quote unquote bulk, or multiple sizes. As you guys can see, we have six or seven of the exact same shoe on each one. So on these ones, we'll have anywhere from a size five up to a size 13. And we do label everything. That way it's easier for everybody to find. I'd say the stuff on this side, it's kind of like your everyday, you know, yeah. you see this stuff a lot more. And then on that side, it's more curated. It's a lot more of the rarer stuff. So if someone's specifically looking for something more rare, they'd probably find it on that side. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the store, we do have quite a long clothing rack. All this stuff that is in bags is stuff that we essentially don't want people to get their little grubby fingers on. It's a little bit more expensive, so we do keep it wrapped. And then a lot of this stuff is very popular streetwear brands. And then a little bit cheaper items here. And then at the very front, we have our own personal merch. We have quite a bit of it. We do a lot of traveling and make special merch for every event that we go to. They're like sneaker expos. So we travel all over the US and we make specific merch for that exact event. That way when people come up to the table because they want to meet us, we make a shirt exactly for the city that we're in. So this one is from Washington DC, but we usually try to do a monument of any sort from that exact city. And then up behind Tia over here, this is our grade school or our women's sizes. It's hard to keep this stuff in stock. Women do love their shoes, so they sell out pretty fast in these guys, but as well as our bulk, we keep a lot of those ones in women's sizes as well. What would you say has been the biggest factor of your success? Definitely our reputation, being able to spot fakes, being able to authenticate thousands of different shoes, as well as our online presence. With those two things, we've built so many reoccurring customers, people that come in store, and a lot of customers that buy online repeatedly as well. So this is very different than the other location. So tell us about yes. that setting and how much that matters. Um, so basically, as soon as you walk into the door, you're gonna see our huge front counter right here. People that are looking to sell will come straight to the front counter. And then it's kind of set up the similar way as the mall. It's kind of by size. So we got smaller sizes from the bottom, bigger sizes going up, and then they go all the way down. So again, okay. come in, shop by size. And then if you're looking to sell, you'll come right up here. Tell us about your team structure. Who's where and what sort of managers do you have in place? Uh, we have our general manager, Joe, who kind of swings back and forth between both stores. He knows pretty much anything that we would know when it comes to buying, pricing, customer service. He's pretty much, you know, just a one man do it all type of thing, which is really nice, hard to find. And then we physically are in the stores every single weekend. And then throughout the week, we're kind of just, you know, on call, whatever they need, we're here. And nice. then two employees at each store every single day. Yeah, if things are slower on the weekdays, why have two people? Why not just one? Safety is one thing. And then 
The second thing is we do get a lot of shipments in from people that are selling to us and then sellers come in as well. So having two people to be able to process shoes and get everything listed on the website and have everything okay. organized, all the photos are taken nicely, shipping is taken care of. It's just easier for two people to do it than one. Yeah. Do you ever watch these episodes and think it's great that they're making all these recommendations on how to handle a team and how to get a good one, but right now it's just me, no team. So if UpFlip could just recommend me how to get started in my business, that'd be great. If you've ever thought that, that's why we wanna to introduce to you Taylor Brands. Here you can go get your business set up as an LLC and get everything you need to make your business an up and coming, completely covered venture. You can get all the things you didn't know you needed in one place, such as licenses and permits, business documents, business insurance, a business bank account, and tax experts that specialize in getting small business owners the maximum deductions. And the best part, you can start your business absolutely anywhere. So if you want to get started right now without a hassle, use Taylor Brands. Thanks for watching and make sure to check out Taylor Brands in the description below. And now let's get back to finding out how much these two women are raking in. What are your average monthly revenues today and how much profit margin are you seeing on that? A typical month is about $400,000 and we're seeing about 20 to 30% profit margin on that. 20 to 30% every yeah. month, okay. Yeah. Welcome. What are the biggest costs for a shoe reseller and how do you keep these prices low? Boxes for sure, even starting out with your shipping items, your shipping boxes. So what we do is we use boxes. If you order from Amazon a lot or anywhere else, we use those boxes, save them. And the other thing we do is find a bulk supplier. That way we can buy a thousand at a time. Right now our box cost is about a dollar a box. So we have to counter that into our sales as well. About how much of your revenue is from online sales versus at your retail locations? I'd say it's probably 50-50 between our online market as well as our two storefronts. Okay, is there an item that sells better online versus in-store? Definitely the higher end or the higher dollar items move better online. And then in-store, I'd say like the two to $400 range. Um, that's like the money spot for stuff selling in-store. Yeah. So why do you think that is? I think we have a, just a much larger reach online. And then in person, it's kind of just our everyday sneakerhead, you know, maybe not looking to do, spend that much every single day. So the $200 to $400 range is just, you know. Yeah, fits most people. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why is it important for people to have a niche as a reseller and how do you identify that early on? I think it's important to stand out. Individuality in this is very important. There's 10 sneaker stores around us, what makes us different from everybody else and what makes them different from us, you know? I think it's very important. Okay. Yeah, I think what makes us stand out is we make sure that every single thing that we have inside our store is listed online as well. Yeah. It's really laborious, mm -hmm. but it makes a huge impact because people that can't physically come shop in the store, they can see it online and buy it. So it's a good conversion rate for us. And I feel like it just makes the shopping experience a lot better. Yeah. You have 130,000 subscribers on your YouTube channel. Yes. How long has that been? Two Since years. Yeah. Two years, okay. Two well, years. tell us about that. How has that grown your business? I mean, I can't even explain how much it's helped our business. T and I are both pretty introverted and shy and just like in our own little bubble with our small friend group. So even starting YouTube was a huge leap for us. It was a huge, uncomfortable thing for us to do. But after we posted our first video, we saw the results right away. Our online orders, off the charts, the people that came in to visit us said, hey, I saw you on YouTube. Never knew you guys, never knew about your store, what you guys were doing. So it's honestly changed our lives. Yeah, I, I would say if you're even hesitant about starting YouTube or getting yourself or your business online, just do it. Anything that you're gonna grow from, is gonna make you uncomfortable. And that's kind of what we told ourselves. We were really like, ooh, should we start the YouTube? Should we not? And then we kind of just put the camera up and just kind of went for it. Mm. And we grew over time and so did the business. Can you share some advice on a seller using YouTube to grow their business? Yeah, I think customers and people in general just really appreciate transparency. So the more that you can put on YouTube about yourself, about your business, people are gonna appreciate that rawness. Not really, they look really fake to me, so I probably wouldn't recommend oh. like selling them to anybody. Mm. And be drawn to it. I feel like that's what a lot of our viewers appreciate and that's why they watch is because we literally put the camera up, they see what we're paying for the shoe, they see kind of the everyday operations and people like to watch that kind of stuff. Okay, so you're actually posting videos of your interaction with customers? Yeah, yeah. unedited for the most part and just pretty much raw transactions, yeah. yeah. All right, can you list every social media platform that you guys are on? All of them, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, literally anyone that we have access to, we're, we're on there. We wanna blast our name, our business on every social media platform that we can. Okay. 
And which of those are the most beneficial and how do you engage on them? I think the most beneficial ones would be Instagram and TikTok. I think if you post reels, those are really popular right now. I know I sit in bed and I watch reels at night. <laughs> and so if you post reels and TikToks, you're gonna get your business or whatever you're trying to do in front of people's eyes. You're posting shoes that are brought into the store on your social media and how quickly are those selling once you post them? Sometimes instantly. Sometimes as soon as we post it, it'll sell. We have a pretty big turnover of the stuff that we add onto our website. Sounds important to post them then. It is, it's, we definitely, it's one of our main focuses throughout the day. Okay. Tell us about the best place to buy items to resell. I think if you're starting out, definitely offer up eBay. Now, obviously you do have to be a little bit careful with offer up because there's a lot of fakes or people that you could get into a bad situation with when you are doing yeah, a meetup. Yes, can be scary. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so as the business has grown, have you changed where you get your items from? I feel like now more so we buy a lot from people that come into both of our brick and mortars. Yeah. We still source online a little bit, but as far as like meetups and offer up and stuff, we don't do that as much anymore only because we have people that come in and sell us. Do you have a guess as to what the percentage is of how much is coming from people bringing the shoes into store? Uh, I'd probably say it's up to like 80% of walk-ins people selling to us and then 20% of customers emailing us uh, collections or different stuff they want to sell us that they would ship in. What platform do you use for your online store and why? Uh, we use Shopify. We found that it is the best integration with our in-store as well as our online and the fact that it's so user-friendly we can have six devices between our employees and us using it without any hip hiccups at all. There are some cons that come with it though. We do have to pay a pretty high transaction fee. So we pay almost 4% for every shoe that we Whoa. sell on there. And then uh, a monthly cost as well. And when it comes to storage, are you guys sending out from the inventory in your store? Or how does that work? Yes, cool. all of the inventory that is in either store is listed on our Shopify website. So it just makes it streamline again for shipping when something sells online or in store, it's in store and ready to go out. Okay. And, yeah, and when it sells online, it marks it out of stock on our POS and then vice versa, it sells in store, it marks it out of stock on our online. Okay, so anybody watching right now could see your whole inventory exactly. that's in your store. They definitely yeah. could, yes. All right. All right, blitz questions. So you have 10 seconds to answer these. Can okay. you do it? Yes. All right, let's go. North Idaho Handyman asks, with the economy tightening and people tightening their purse strings, what do you recommend purse selling strings. on eBay now? And do you believe that this platform will increase or decrease in profitability? Yeah, I think eBay is great for pre-owned shoes, which have great profit margins. So eBay 100%. All right, next question is, do you still find enjoyment in what you do at this level? Totally, we still enjoy waking up every morning and knowing that we're going to work for ourselves and building our own business. What apps do you use to purchase for inventory to sell? Because I've never encountered a real person on Facebook Marketplace or any other app, and they always end up being scammers. Uh, again, eBay, they have great buyer and seller protection, so it's just, you can shop with confidence, you can sell with confidence on there. All Things Wack asks, your biggest cue for a sneaker drop? Definitely download the Nike Sneakers app, turn on your post notifications from them, and then just go on social media, go on Twitter, follow any sneakers accounts that you guys can find. Everybody talks about releases when they come out. And get up early. All yes. the hot sneaker drops are at 7 a.m., so make sure you're up and ready to click that button. Yes. Okay, <laughs> great. Why did you decide to open a brick and mortar location instead of keeping it online because you've had so much success online? We honestly really did try to keep it online as yeah. long as we could. You know, the overhead ex expenses scared us and we just figured that if we create a brick and mortar location, people could come to the store and we could display all of our inventory yeah. and have people just shop instead of having to post everything online and just go do meetups. It was yeah. safety convenience and just a lot easier for us as well. Yeah. I think a big thing of it was also timing. Tia had just graduated college. At the time I was working at Boeing, I had gotten laid off when they did their big layoffs. So both of us had more time to actually be in a physical location. So that's, I feel like when we really were like, we can do this now, this is a good timing to do so. And that's another reason why we went for a 400 square foot spot yeah. because the rent was a little under 1700. It was pretty low risk and they let us sign a year lease. So we kind of figured like, hey, if it doesn't work, then it's only a year and mm -hmm. kind of just took our risks there. Yeah, what are the advantages and disadvantages of being at a physical location? The main advantage is being able to display all your inventory in one centralized location, build rapport with your customers, build relationship, and then just be a part of the local community. Mm -hmm. And receiving new product in? Exactly, yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so what are some of the disadvantages? Security is a big thing. Um, overhead's a huge thing. You're paying rent, insurance, security, utilities. Mm -hmm. You just are paying a lot more every single month. 
What's been your biggest mistake or failure as a business owner and how did you overcome it? The only time we've ever felt like giving up or quitting was actually two weeks before our grand opening of our very first store three mm. or four years ago. We had been broken into, I think it was like 10 days before our wow. grand opening was supposed to be. Someone backed their car into our store, broke what? all the glass, yeah. ran in in the middle of the night, I think it was like 3 a.m., took like $20,000 worth of clothes and we had pretty much drained our bank account to fill that store with product. So it was just like a huge blow to not only have grand opening 10 days away, but have that much product yeah. taken away from us. Since then, we've really stepped up our security. We've realized that a lot of these shoes are expensive and it's a high target for theft. So we spent a lot of money on security cameras, mm -hmm. roll down gates, even an overnight guard we, we pay for, which wow. is a big expense. So it kind of makes sense to be in a mall because you're not going to be having somebody drive in exactly. and smash their car yes. into the front. Yeah, that was another main reason why we wanted to come in here. For more insights on how to start an online clothing reselling business, go watch our episode 49 on the Upflip podcast, where we interviewed the founder of a $2.9 million per month business, Unique Vintage. All right, so we talked about negotiation and how important that is. You have to have that skill if you're gonna be in this business. So can we actually see a real life example of what a negotiation would look like? Yeah, let's take you in the back and show you how to negotiate. Okay. All right, so if I'm a seller, I'm coming up to the counter and say, hey, I've got these shoes I want to sell. These are the Soleil Heap and Berry Crocs in the black colorway. We're just going to take a look at the box, make sure all the fonts on the box label look good. We're going to open up the shoe. We got these stickers that mean it's goat verified, which is another uh, marketplace online that does authentication and shoe sales. Mm -hmm. We're going to take it out. We're going to look over the shoe. It is brand new condition. I'm going to give it a sniff. Make sure you give it a sniff. Yeah, that's good. How's it smell? I, I, can, I, can tell that, I can tell that's real. Yeah, okay, perfect. <laughs> and then when we go to reference our prices, we go on StockX. So Stock we'll X, look this okay. up. We'll go Salehi Bimberry Croc. We'll see it right here. This one is a size 12 men. Looks like this is going online for about $100 right now. And retail on this is about $85. So there's not that big of a difference there. Mm -hmm. I know we would list this in our shop for probably around a $120, $130. Okay. And then to get that profit margin, I usually would just take $130 times 30%. Need to make at least $39 on this shoe. So we'll take okay. $130 minus $39. So I'll probably offer the seller around $90. But if I'm the seller and I come up and say, hey, I want $120 for this shoe. I know it's going for around 100, but I think you guys could sell it for a little bit more than that. Mm -hmm. We try to work with the customer. I want them to leave happy. We want to be happy. We try to meet a middle ground. So we are going to list it for like around 130. So I'd probably, the most I could probably offer you is around 90. Can you do 95? Yes, I can. Perfect. So even a $5 difference can make a big impact. She leaves happy. We're happy with the price that we got it at. Yeah. And the profit margin is still there. So are people constantly looking to get ridiculous prices or are people kind of know what the market value is? Honestly, it really just depends on the person. Some people come in and they understand the concept of the store. So they'll even tell us, hey, this is what it's going for. I want X amount. I know you guys have to make a little money on top too. Mm. And then other people come in and they want exactly what's shown online, exactly what that shoe is valued at. Yeah. So we do have some people that we don't buy from only because the margin is not there for us. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense for us to buy the shoe. How often are people walking away without making a deal? I'd say our close rate is probably close to 70%. It's pretty high. Yeah. The experience, we want the customer to be happy. We want them to bring the shoes back in the future. Mm -hmm. So we try our best, even if we're not making the full profit margin, we try our best to take the shoe. Okay. How many people do you have on your Sneak City team? So including T and I, we have six. So four employees and then us two, and we're a very close-knit team. We're mm -hmm. friends outside of work. We go get dinner all the time as well. Cool. Yeah, I think it works best if you're really friends with the people that you work with. And obviously, in this industry, you have to really trust the people that you allow into the store mm -hmm. just because there's so much expensive stuff. And um, yeah. we've just built really tight-knit relationships with our teammates and something that I actually really cherish. So, What is your day-to-day -day role in the business and how does the planning for that go? Like, do you start here, come up with a plan, and then head to the shops? It's definitely changed over the years. Me and Anastasia physically used to be in the shop 11 to 8 every single day for like mm. two years straight. But we slowly brought on teammates and now our day-to-day day life is to make sure both stores are stocked and just be the right hand man to our employees if they need any help. So before you were saying that what keeps your reputation high in this industry is your ability to spot a fake shoe. So can you show us how to spot fakes? Yeah, definitely. So this is a shoe that someone actually was shipping to us to sell to us. We deemed that it was not authentic, but we do keep them for, you know, educational purposes for our videos and for our employees. But the main thing that we saw with this shoe, uh, you take the black light out and you're going to see these marks on the toe box there. Okay, yeah. Kind of see along that 
mm. along the toe right there. These are not supposed to be there at all. They're called stitch guides, stitch lines. Um, a lot of the fake companies will put these on their shoes kind of to show where they're supposed to stitch. And Nike, I've never seen a Nike shoe with that. So that's the first red flag that I saw with this shoe. And then another thing is the smell test. Smell test, what's that? Tell me what you smell when you it smells very chemically. Chemically, yeah, exactly. So Nike shoes, each of them have a certain smell, but when you get such a chemically like glue smell, that is, yeah. it is a huge red flag. And then on top of the stitch guides, along with the smell, and then the box as well is, this is almost too bright. So mm -hmm. you really just have yeah, to pay attention to the small details. I mean, the everyday person is not gonna see these and be like, oh, they're fake. So you really do have to be detail oriented and kind of know what you're looking for. Yeah, how about texture? Texture is a huge thing with fakes too. I mean, when you squeeze it, you can kind of just feel it feels a bit flimsy. Mm -hmm. Like not real leather, a bit pop plasticky. Yeah, it's just once you feel hundreds of pairs of dunks and shoes a day, you kind of get to know like how they're supposed to feel. They're not supposed to bend super easily. This mm -hmm. is actually not too bad of a fake. This is one of oh. the better fakes I've seen, but sometimes the shoes will like, you'll be able to take it and literally like go like that. Yeah. But this is not too bad. But some of the yeah. fakes that I've seen, um, the materials are pretty bad. Yeah. All right, so I would have no idea how to spot this as a fake, aside from maybe that test. But how could somebody new to this industry start becoming a professional at that? Uh, I'd say the number one thing is to get a black light. I mean, this is the very first thing that we do. We just shine it with a black light. Yeah. So that's most important. Yeah. And then smell, box texture. Always look at the box label. Sometimes there's a sticker on the inside of the box, so it should have certain indications on there as well. How do you stay organized and manage your day-to-day -day workflow? Took us a while at first. Yep. Try to be the most efficient that we can. We used to take home all of our shoes and ship them at home after we got home from work, and we realized, oh, maybe it's smarter to mm -hmm. ship them at the shop while we're already there. So just over time, we've learned kind of our flow and we have it down to a daily routine now. I mean, we come in here in the morning, we get all our shipping done, and then from there we focus on adding more shoes to the website and helping customers in store. Are there SOPs you have in place and how did you develop those? To be honest, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily uh, this, 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 and this, or like an operations essentially. We've just learned over time, like Tia said, of when we get a new item in, we clean it, make sure it's presentable, we take photos, we price it, and we get it listed on our Instagram, and then it does make it to the website instantly, and then it, hopefully it sells, we pack it, ship it, and then rinse and repeat. Okay, so what happens when you receive a shoe? Is it going into a system, the prices? Yeah, so basically this shoe, we just got it in. We have the price that we paid right here, either I... On a sticky note. On a sticky note, not <laughs> always. Sometimes that's the easiest way for us to do it, but it's we easy. have the price that we paid, myself or Anastasia, or one of our employees will price it. From there, it'll go back into the photo station. Photos will get taken, it'll get listed onto the website, and then it'll hit the shelves, and then it'll just wait to sell. Yeah. And then that times how many repairs we get in throughout the day. What extra challenges are there for a woman-owned business in a male-dominated industry? Ooh, sneakers are definitely more male-focused. I try to just take the approach, you know, we have the same similar interests. We both like the same things. We're both here for shoes. And so I just try to relate with guys on that aspect. I mean, it's definitely different for a guy to walk in here and see you know two females behind the counter but i try to treat everybody the same no matter what gender i mean it doesn't really matter to me yeah. and that's a wrap i hope you enjoyed this episode if you want to see another entrepreneur who started an online clothing boutique go check out our interview with urbanity owner lee smith who makes hundred two thousand dollars per month <laughs>